Right, okay guys, welcome to another Blame It's Only. It's been a wee while since I've done one of these and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Mr. Bill X Ocean Graphic Meister Harbison. <laughs> That's not my middle name. <laughs> Firstly, can I can I say uh, I love your t-shirt? Now, I'm, I'm assuming anyone under the age of about, I don't know, 40 may not know what that is. Possibly 40. Everybody else called, can guess. Yeah, it was called a, it's even it's even Space Hopper Orange, I notice. I know it's the right colour and everything. <laughs> <laughs> it could actually be something else now that you look at that, but I, I know that to be yeah. I know that to be a space hopper. Yeah. I never actually did you did you have a space hopper back in the day then, Bill? I did. But it was always in a cupboard. I could never used it because it was rubbish. <laughs> I never go one. It meant that you could go to different places, but go like half the speed. <laughs> I think uh, I, I never had one. My sister did have one right enough until uh, I, think, I think my dad was creosoting uh, the fence. That's a that's a phrase you'll never hear. You can't use creosote. Apparently, it's banned. But he was creosoting the fence, and the the, the creosote went on the space hopper, and it was it was no more. Oh, it melted it. It was, I think, quite literally it did. I, I, so she was the, she was the too please. Anyway, listen. One of the, the, the first <laughs> question. Oh, thanks for, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me. By the way, Bill, I do appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. The, the question I always like to ask any, any of my guests was, when now we've already we chat offline. Bill is, Bill's a young bloke like me. He looks a lot younger as well. Um, when, when did you first become aware of? A computer or a, a video game. What was your very, very first kind of experience? Um, when I was at primary school, probably around 1977, 78, uh, we got taken on a school trip to London um, on the train, and we stayed in the hotel and did various things down there. But when we got to the hotel, there was a Pong arcade machine in the court in the corner of the. It would have been the bar, probably. Mm -hmm. And it was just rammed with kids, like rows deep. And obviously, it was like, what, "What's that?" We'd never seen anything like it before. Mm -hmm. And everybody was. You had no chance of getting a go on it or even getting close to it. But I was sort of. <laughs> Stood at the back of the room watching people playing it and thinking, oh, that's uh, that's pretty smart. So then I went from that to, I think my dad might have bought me one of those ones that you plug into the TV and it's the, like the tennis and the yeah the football game. The Benetton. Ah, uh, yeah. So I had one of them. But the computer would probably have been the ZX81 was brought into my science class um, probably around my home, when I was doing my own levels and just this little black <laughs> thing. I mean, it looked really futuristic because it was dead thin and stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's bloody shit, really. But, uh, and the science teacher like typed out this program on it and it started doing stuff on the TV and that was it. I just wanted to like have one of them yeah. And then obviously yeah. moved up and saved up various amounts of pocket money and bought myself a Spectrum and just got stuck into that. It's, it's interesting what you're saying there because my very first, uh, it's exactly the same, my very, very first experience of a computer would be Pong, Edinburgh Airport. Um, this was, and it would be hard for kids to understand this, but back in the 70s, um, on a Friday night, um, if we were good, my mum and dad would say, do you want to go to Edinburgh Airport to watch the planes land? And that was like a big thing. We used to go to Edinburgh Airport. and there was still a it now. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't, I, my dad wasn't, a, a, he wasn't a, a plane spotter, but he had one of these wee transistor radios and you could listen to the pilots talking. Oh, yeah. Um, but so, yeah, we used to go there and we'd, watch the planes land, uh, and then if we're lucky, we'd go and get a bag of chips on the way home. But I always remember going up, well, I can still remember going into Edinburgh Airport, and we were about to go up the steps, or it was called, I think, Turnhouse Airport. And uh, on the left-hand side, I remember seeing 
this what I, I I could describe as like a large piece of furniture with like a TV screen, and I'm like, what the hell is that? And I remember kind of looking at it, and my mom's like, come on, hurry up! And it was Pong, and I didn't really pay much attention to it. Um, and then uh, my granny, my granny bought the Benetton, and then when I the first time I saw it, she she let me take it home, and that was that. And then like yourself, it, hi, it was actually at high school, uh, probably at the end of the day. Must be about seventy nine. It was my, it was my English teacher. Yeah, it was my English teacher. He says, "Oh, well, we've got something a wee bit different to show you." And he brought out this what turned out to be a ZX eighty one, and he put it in the TV. And well, that's amazing. I think I think it came up with a word for like five seconds or half a second. You have to try and type it what it was. But obviously back then, he probably. You probably found that your teacher, my teacher, you probably found it was their own computer that they brought into school. I <laughs> uh, quite possibly, yeah, because he, he typed in this program which was like a, uh, a Mandelbrot generator on the screen. So it, it, would, it was plotting squares on the screen that was sort of like a kaleidoscope. So it was like looking at the lines of code that he was typing in and working out how it was trying to, how it was doing the things on the, on the screen. So that was that was one of the things that fascinated me about it. And also, before I got the grandstand, I think my mum and I went to visit somebody in hospital, and we went into a cafe to get something to eat after we were waiting to get the bus home. And there was a Space Invaders machine built into the table. No, oh, the old I co uh, cocktail, I cocktail. That's what it was. Uh, they, had, they had one of them. <laughs> And obviously, I, once I was on that, I didn't want to leave. But come on, the bus is going. We need to. Get, no, no. <laughs> so where where are you? Where were you? Can you born and bred then, Bill? Where where were your sort of formative years as a teenager? Where were they about? Um, I was in a little village outside here on the west coast. All right. So so presumably, well, being down, was it on the coast? Did you have? Oh no, no, it was miles away from everywhere. It was like oh, was it? and everything else was outside. So it was like, so you you didn't exactly have like ar and stuff like that. Yeah, you never had like arcades like, I mean largs and all that kind of stuff. Was that was that on salt coats? Would that not be kind of uh no, I think the, the the one that I used to go to was in air. So that was like a good forty minutes on the bus. <laughs> aye, aye. Well, we didn't, we maybe went once a month or something. We didn't go very often. Yeah, the, I think that's the, probably why I got into the the the, uh, the spectrum because you would wait for like the arcade versions of games <laughs> coming out so you could actually play them because you had no chance in the arcade. So did you? Did you not? I mean, what, did, did you get much much like uh, time playing arcade games? Did you? Did your mum and dad take you to Blackpool or anything like that at all? Or? No, I mean my my first time to England was for my interview at Ocean. Sorry, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and if I either went to um, air on the bus with some mates, or once I think I went to Glasgow, and that would have been like nineteen eighty six or something. So didn't really get around that much. Yeah, yeah. What? Well, so, just very quickly going back, what is? Uh, so, you, you got your? Did you? What was your first uh, home computer that you got? Uh, I had that? the I had the ZX eighty one for a bit, and then I I was sort of like, what, what should I get next? Should I get? I was looking through the magazines, and they they all had different <laughs> ones. Like there was a Noric, and I went, oh, that looks quite good because it's got like plastic <laughs> buttons and all that sort of thing. There's, well, there's a spectrum as well, but that uh, that's uh, it doesn't look that as nice as the Oric. And then I went into school. Obviously, later on they developed like a computer club where they had these really old <laughs> discs that big. You know, them them really old computers, five and a quarter or something. They were either sure. Yeah, so I would meet somebody and say, "Oh, if you get a spectrum, I'll just give you like forty games on a tape." It's like right. <laughs> Get me a spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty much how it did. What one could you get the most copied games for, eh? <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. So, uh, kind of jumping forward a wee bit. So, after the spectrum, what, what 
did you have any? Did you ever get involved with like consoles, Mega Drive or SNES or any of that at all? Or did you go up to 16 um, bit? Oh, yeah, because after, after obviously I bought the Spectrum and then was actually had a job, I just tried everything. So I had, I had a Nintendo, I had a Sega. I even went back and bought a Commodore 64 because I didn't have one. Uh, and then I think I bought an Amiga. Uh, one of my mates had a Sega Saturn. So I've always had some yeah. sort of console, console, yeah. console so, around. So what, what would you say was your, you know, the old uh, desert island uh, disc thing? If you're on a desert island and you're allowed one system with every single game, you know, forget about the issues of power or any that bollocks. What system would you take if you could only ever? That was it. That was the only system you could use. And you can't take a PC because I know how you could uh, really emulate stuff. I would have done that. Um, probably a Switch. A Switch? Oh, I thought you were going to a Spectrum or a Switch. Yeah, yeah. Probably a Switch because. Uh, well, obviously, you can you can play old NES games on it. You can play old SNES games on it as well. You can play Spectrum games on it as well. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't decide between a Switch or a 3DS because I used to really like my 3DS, but then I I don't use it that much anymore. But I, I yeah. do I do use the Switch. So is that your kind of current gaming system that you use? Is it? Um. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I play a lot of PC stuff, and I've got like a, a PS4 downstairs. You know, the the sort of upgraded one. So I never bothered with the PS4. Oh, the one, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. It's like the P. It was a plus. Is it a plus PS5? Oh, plus the Pro. Game. Sorry. Yeah, the Pro. PC yeah, I've got that. Pro, one I've got one of them. I don't know what the difference is. So, what what would you, to put you on the spot? What would you say your three video favorite video games on any system are? Again, if you can only play three games and that's it, what three would it be? You can include arcade in this, by the way. It wouldn't be an arcade game. because they're just, Really? No, because they're just designed to eat money. That's all that it is. not for a <laughs> gaming experience. But you need to think of the long-term the long -term challenge of a, an arcade game. Um, I think Zelda Breath of the Wild. I've... That's I, I've uh, I've bought that and I've only played it for about an hour. Uh, and I, Tony Temple, the guy was mentioned, he he actually touted it as his favourite arcade game uh, of all time. Not mm. arcade game, video game. Is it is it worth sticking with? Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just with the amount of stuff you can do and the the freedom that you've got in the world. Um. I think the next they're all in the tip could have been Nintendo titles, aren't they? Mario <laughs> Kart. Mario Kart 8. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Um God, I can't what else? The last thing that I played a lot of was probably Elite Dangerous on the PC. How uh, how how many hours have you put into that? Are you expecting me to say like Jet Set Willy and <laughs> <laughs> That's a good attack? I know it's supposed to be a sort of retro. Oh yeah. no, you know what? Oh, I've I've and I think I upset a lot of people. I'm a massive. I would I would probably I would probably regard myself less a video gamer and more a, a gaming historian. I just love the whole nostalgia of the first seen a computer game, first seen Star Not in fact, I wouldn't say the first time I saw Space Invaders, it was the first time I heard Space Invaders. That noise, what the hell is that? Boom, it's just it got into your soul. Oh, yeah. um, I actually play very, very little video games other than on a Sunday. I make an arse of myself on my live streams. Um, I actually play very little games. And I've said that quite a few times, I would I would go in so far as to say eighty percent, and again I'm going to get lots of people disliking me for this. Eighty percent, if not higher, of all eight bit games are absolute pants, and you wouldn't really want to play them for any more than a couple of seconds. Don't get me wrong, there are some Stonewall classic games that I still go back to playing, but if I had to pick, you know, 
I'm stuck with Commodore 64 for the rest of my life, or would it be an Xbox 360? I'm going to go for the Xbox 360 because you would soon get bored, I think. 80% is a bit short. A bit. A bit short. A bit short. You think it's going to be more than that? You're thinking 95, 96, aren't you? Probably, yeah. <laughs> But no, I mean, I, I love oh, mine are going to be in the ninety six percent as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I know I'm I'm with you. Like I say, uh, yeah, there's, I've, I mean that. I think that I mean it's it's hard to try and describe to people, people like my daughter who've always known video games. She's always known what it's like to see herself on camera and all this kind of stuff. But to try and Try and explain to somebody the thrill of not just looking at a TV. You're looking at a TV, but you can actually influence what is on that. The, the thrill of moving a joystick and seeing this thing on the screen moving left and right. That was just... You couldn't do it before. You couldn't ah. do it before. You were just like passively observing it the was, screen. Yeah. It was absolutely mind-blowing to see that. And that that the thrill of getting my first computer, getting my first Commodore 64, whatever. It's just, I've never, ever, it's like the old uh, law of diminishing returns. Every system that I've bought since the C64, the thrill factor has got smaller and smaller and smaller, to the point when I got my Xbox Series X, I, I got it, and I, I think it was, I got it on the Monday, and I thought, oh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it at the weekend. I was that, this, I was that unexcited about it. <laughs> that's just age you just <laughs> lose your excitement as you get older aye possibly as mental but uh, anyway so so when you left when you left school did you go to college uni or did you go straight into the kind of getting a job gig um I stayed and did A levels and then I stayed and did an extra year we called it uh, six six year studies which was supposed to be to yeah. prepare you to apply to college. Were you sorry, Bill? Were you were you still living in Scotland at this point? Yeah. Aye, because it's uh, a. <clears throat> I'll correct you. It's a uh, grades and hires. That that is right. <laughs> yeah, it's all grades and hires. But we had like above that, there was like yeah, six year studies. Six year. Yeah, Did you have yeah, that as well. Did you what was six year study? What was six year studies again? I can't. I remember the phrase. I can't remember what the hell it was. Um, you basically went in when you wanted and didn't do much work, as far as I can remember. I remember going in at like 11 o'clock and just being in for a couple of hours. Um, but that was supposed to prepare me for, I was going to apply to Glasgow Art College. Oh, I, classic. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Um, I applied for carlisle and went for the interview there and then thought i didn't want to go to carlisle because it was too far away uh, then i applied for glasgow and in the process um uh, applied for a job at ocean in manchester and then moved to manchester and yeah interesting so you actually so i've got here how did the ocean gig come about so did you see like an advert in the paper or something no it was um I'd always been sort of interested in art, you know. I, I was, I was like um, drawing from about the age of four, so I was always drawing pictures and stuff because, like, I was I didn't have any brothers and sisters, so most of my time was in my room drawing stuff, drawing mm -hmm. comics and all that sort of thing. So I just saw this as like this is new. This is like an exciting thing to get art and pictures and things on. So I just started like. Um, I bought a, a copy of The Artist 2 um, that allowed you to draw a complete um, loading screen. And I started knocking these out. And I remember was that, doing... Was that, on the spectrum? was that in the spectrum? Yeah. yeah. So I remember doing a, uh, a portrait of uh, Paul McCartney from give my regards to Broad Street because there was an advert for it in a magazine. And I thought, I'll just draw that. So I did that. Um, and then I thought, I used to get seen VG that had um, pictures of stuff that was out in the arcades. 
And then I always thought, well, a lot of the Spectrum versions of games were a bit shit. So I thought, I'll I'll do what I think it should look like <laughs> on, on the loading screen. So I, I, I sort of laid out, I think I did, did a few. I did a, a, a football game or something with the, the characters all stood around in the ball. And I did the, the panel with the score and all of that on it. And I knocked out <laughs> a few of these. And then... For some reason, I don't know why it took me so long, but it sort of came to me that obviously I was buying these games, but somebody had to be drawing all these graphics and coding it. So I looked through the magazines and I found an advert for Ocean, but it was advertising their games. I think whatever was out at the time might have been Street Hawk. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And it had the address at the bottom six central street manchester i thought i thought right i'm going to do a load of these mock-ups and i'm going to put them in a tape and i'm just going to send them around different companies i didn't want to send them to ocean at first because obviously they were going through the street hawk days and i wasn't i thought no they must be going a bit downhill now (laughs) i got various letters back from not interested to yeah, these are good. Can you send us some more? And then I, after about a year, I got a bit sort of disheartened and thought, oh, I'll just send it to Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I stuck it in the post, and about two weeks later, I got a I got a phone call asking me to go for an interview. So and I went you, down there. Yep. Yeah. Um. It was like in the morning, so I had to. I had some savings. I think my mum and dad gave me some money, and they paid for a flight from Glasgow Airport to Manchester. So I flew down. To, <laughs> I flew down to Ocean Software, which they they chat about it for years afterwards. Oh, here's Bill. He flew down for his interview. You know, what a big head and all. It was the only way I was going to get down and back up. So. Um, yeah, I went for my interview, um, showed, the, showed Gary and Steve Wahid, who was the graphics manager at the time, my stuff, and they were like looking at it on the, the TV. And then they both went out of the room and came back in probably about five minutes later and said, can you start in two weeks? Wow. And I'd never had a job before. <laughs> so I'd, I'd never even done any animation. It was just based on these images. Yeah, and yeah. then when I started on my first day, they said, uh, "Right, so you're going to be working on Daily Thompson's Olympic Challenge." I'm like what? I've I, <laughs> I've got no experience. Why are you giving me this massive title to do? So <laughs> I'm expecting to be fired every week, but I just like <laughs> stuck at it, just stuck at it because it was all I could do. And That's I remember- awesome. Yeah. I remember like phoning up my mum and dad and saying, oh, I don't know if I can do this. But it's like really, I'm, it's like really stressful and, you know, it's taking ages and I don't really know what I'm doing and I think I'm going to get fired. And my mum's like, oh, don't worry about it. You can always come back here and live. And I'm like, fuck it. No, I'm going to really stick it out now. There's no way I'm going back. No way I'm going back. So at that point, when you when you applied for that job, then you obviously you'd obviously decided in your own head that if you'd been offered the job, that you were happy to relocate because that's got a big thing for that. I mean, what age were you at that point, then, Bill? Twenty-one. Yeah, and you you were, you were still living at home, presumably. And what what were you doing? Had you you'd obviously left school, but you just kind of kicking about at that point. Yeah, you yeah, I was basically trying to find anything to get me out of the house and get me out of where I was living. Yeah. Because yeah. I wanted to go and do something else somewhere else. Uh-huh. So what uh d- does does uh, Gary Bracey know that the ocean was the very, very last choice? He probably does. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna know now anyway, because I'll tell I'm, him, I'm <laughs> not to him directly, but I he probably does know by now. <laughs> But I didn't know. I didn't know that he was there. I didn't know that he was assembling this team, the, this whole new team of people that were going to like bring out all these amazing new games in the next few years. Yeah, I'm just lucky to have been got involved in just, it, got a chance just, to be involved in it. 
just just being part of that. Um, so, what what other companies did you apply for and and said no thanks? You can name and shame them. <laughs> um, there was a comp- a small company called Electronic Arts. They just said they, they brought out a couple of games. I don't know what happened. They never keep me anything, no. mate. No. Um, they sent a postcard basically saying no thanks. Um, I'm trying to think of them. There was one called Superior Software. All oh, right, quite unsuperior. Yeah, I think they did most of the stuff in the BBC, if I remember rightly. Uh, right. What about uh, Elite? Elite Gremlin Graphics. Elite was the one that kept sending me letters back saying, "Oh, can you send us some more stuff?" <laughs> but it was such a slow process because I would post the tape. And then it would take a week for them to get it, probably another week for them to look at it, another week for them to reply, and then another week for it to get back up to me. Aye. So it was just like too slow. <laughs> Aye, too, not... too slow. Yeah, yeah. So you, you got the you got the gag ocean. So who who was there any notable guys that um that you were kind of working with? I mean, because I think I, I'll be honest, the, the point you were kind of putting out you were working for Ocean, I had, are you talking about kind of 87, 88, something like that, would it be? Would that be? Yeah, I started in 88. I, I had, uh, I had actually moved, I had moved away from 8, but I was on to the Commodore Amiga by that point, so a lot of these games completely bypassed me, um, I didn't have a neat bit at that point, I've, obviously in the, the intervening 40 years, um, I've, I've, I'm fully aware of them, um, the early, early games of uh, the eight bits. I mean, I think you'd probably agree that it was playability, graphics, and sound in that order of importance. Because the, the early machines literally had so little memory that the graphics were going to be shite. You know, look at an Atari twenty uh, twenty six hundred game. The graphics are usually shite. Um, the sound is just the occasional ping and pop but the gameplay it's all about the gameplay but then I think as I mean at the end of the day the, the Spectrum hardware and the Commodore 64 hardware was still the same but I think as as the the, the, the sort of industry started to evolve and mature consumers were wanting more for their money you know and obviously Ocean started to buy in all these film deals and um you know, I think there were you can clearly see a sort of like an industry of two halves um, between like the early Spectrum games, your Mister Wimpies and all that, and then you've got something like Robocop, which is just like you know completely mm. different. So you were obviously you were part of the Barat Pack that was brought in, the sort of like the <laughs> the, the, the the One Direction, the, the new kids on the block sort of thing. You were part of the new brigade. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. Gary probably changed the industry quite a lot because he did spend a lot of money on stuff on um, on licenses. And he, even back in the old Spectrum days, he used to say about one of these days is going to you're going to have a, a, an interactive movie. And, I, and he was always banging on about this interactive movie and stuff. And yet, like now, you play like a game on the PS4. It's basically all it is. Just an interactive movie where you follow the story around and you do the action and then you go to the next bit of the story. So he was probably he was the one that championed that sort of thing, especially with the, the licenses. In fact, I'm gonna go to here. Look, I've still got my ocean mug. Oh fantastic. <laughs> was that the original from back in the day, was it? Yeah. That's originally stolen from the office, yeah. <laughs> well, so, so, yeah, I'm happy. What's that? I, I don't know. I was I was I wandered off there and I didn't actually answer the question. Um yeah, I think when I was there, um when I went for my interview, I met the only people that I knew were Mike Lamb and Don Drake. So when they took me around, they were showing me all the different projects that were being worked on. I didn't know any of the people around. So and then they took me into this room and there's Mike and Don. And I'm like, oh, that's her. I've seen her in a magazine. I've seen him in a magazine. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but they, 
I know it sounds stupid because they were just doing a job, but because it's like media and you're in magazines, yeah, you're like looked up to by people that go out right. and buy these games. It's quite funny because when I've been speaking to like various kind of people from back in the day, there's been a few, there's been guys like Gary Bracey who can just talk for Britain, and then you get other guys who are very, very quiet, and you can also, you can, you can, they're almost quite shy. And But then you have to think to yourself, like, I mean, I know, like, you mentioned, uh, I think it was off camera, you mentioned uh, you met Andrew Braybrook. Now, I think from what I gather, he's extremely shy, and uh, even guys like Jeff Mint are that as well. They're, they're very, they're, they're coders. They're not out there in the TV. They're just code. They like to code, and as you say, they happen to, uh, put cameras in and take a few pictures for the latest uh, crash. Yeah. It's just having no social skills. I mean, I can't really talk because I was pretty much the same. I was like terribly shy when I moved down to Manchester. And I thought, yeah. well, this has to really pull me out of my shell because I'm going to have to talk to people. I'm going to have to interact with people. And it's going to be hell, but I'm going to have to do it. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the one of the reasons I wanted to go somewhere also to get away from the village I lived in because it was horrible but <laughs> just to, to go somewhere more exciting plus you'd obviously heard about all the hot tub parties and all that kind of stuff that Ocean used to have or was that Atari maybe I think that was probably just Gary on his own <laughs> his rubber duck <laughs> Um, so did you did you primarily code for the spectrum then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, that, was there a reason for that? Because well, was there a reason for that? Um, because my portfolio was all spectrum graphics. So um, obviously, the first thing I was put on was on the spectrum. But when I finished the spectrum version, I had to do the Amstrad version. I'd never even seen an Amstrad, so they basically had to put it in front of me and say, right, off you go. So I had to learn a new system, of a, a new way of doing the graphics, because obviously I'd been used to the spectrum where you had like mm -hmm. two colours per character square, and I was given all of these loads of colours with, um, you know, obviously they were twice the width, and it was a bit... Everything looked a bit squashed and a bit weird, but it was still yeah. a chance to use lots and lots of extra colours. Mm -hmm. so, so the thing was that when we started doing, when I moved up to, well, after Daily Thompson, I think we started doing the graphics on the ST because all the coders worked on the ST and then they'd have a, a development system with the spectrum connected up to the ST. Ah, so right, right. Just send it down the cable, and it would just come up automatically what they were what they were working on. So, so when you were drawing graphics for a Spectrum game, were you doing drawing it on an ST then? Yeah, right. After, right. after probably, I think Daily Thompson would have been on this on an actual Spectrum. Everything else after that would have been on an ST. Mm -hmm. Because so, I used to have to come in in the morning, set the tape up to load the artist to, then go and have a, a, a cup of tea, <laughs> come back about 15 minutes later, and it'll finally have loaded in, and then I could start. <laughs> so wait a minute, you, lo you loaded, so the, the spectrum was connected to the ST, but so what were you, were you, were you physically coding on an ST, and then it would... No, 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 when I was doing the... When I was doing Daily Thompson's, I just, oh, I see. I just had the spectrum. I didn't have yeah, an SD yeah. there. Ah, I see. see. Yeah. So did you never did you never code on the, the on the C sixty four at all then? I did. Yeah. Um, only one game though. I did the uh, I did the background graphics for uh, an arcade license called Toki. All right. That's that's a that's a really unknown game and it's actually bloody good i've never i don't think i've played in the c64 i've played but on the amiga i've never given um a zx spectrum version it only came out on the 64 i think oh, right, right, but right. then just this year i think somebody has done a spectrum version of it 
I think it's called Toki Mal. Or like. <laughs> so it looks quite similar. Um, but yeah, I, I had to. I think one of the um, one of the coders there had uh, written his own background graphics editor so that you could you could draw the blocks that you wanted to be on the background, and then you had another area of the screen where you could place them on the map to make out the areas. Yeah, and then you could yeah. Scroll around and put, place the blocks wherever you wanted to. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. that's, so that was only one job, and it was only probably for about a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And that was only, yeah. Yeah, that was good. I quite enjoyed that. I, I would have liked to have done, like, something else in the 64. But you never, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, obviously, being a C64 owner, um, I wouldn't call myself a Commodore 64 snob, but my mate, all my pals had C64s in one metre of spectrum, and I used to kind of just look at it and go, that looks shit, you know. I'd mean, look at my, my Uridium and my Whizball and I'd go and look at his Cobra on the spectrum and go, it's, look at this, it's, it's got rubbish sound and, you know, the graphics are, are black and white. Um, but, the sound is pretty awful in the spectrum. Yeah, but then I've seen, I've again, in the last sort of 20 odd years, I mean, I've uh, I've got a lot of experience with the Spectrum now. And, I, you know, whilst I would still always say the C64 is the one I, I would always pick, the Spectrum's a bloody fantastic machine. It's got so many... I think it was... Uh, is it is it Steve Waheed that you were talking about earlier on? Yeah, he, he, was, he was the graphics manager. Yeah, he, he, he was in Bedroom Civilians. And what he said was, any other computer like the Commodore 64, Amstrad, Atari, you had, you know, you had the limitations of that, 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 and did this, that, and the next thing. So the Spectrum was a, a keyboard and RAM, and you just, there was really no, you just did what you wanted, and because because yeah. of that, it, it, it allowed some incredible games. The Commodore 64 was pretty much made for scrolling the screen, mm -hmm. because you could do it so easily, and... The um, the coders at Ocean, I'm sure they had some sort of competition to see who could do the best and smoothest scroll on the spectrum, like in the shortest amount of code, the most efficient. Because every time somebody did a scroll on the spectrum, somebody else would say, oh, I've done a scroll on the spectrum. It's better than your scroll on the spectrum. <laughs> Just the story, they, that. While they were doing that, and yeah, they did write a really nice scroll. But everything then had to be black and white. And then you were getting games like, oh, God, R-Type, mm. which had a character scroll. And they would have looked at what that and went, that's fucking shit, that. They're doing a character scroll and a shoot em up But it's all bucket loads, and it was colourful, and it was really good. I, I know, it's a, a, damn, a damn good game. Um, what was I going to say? I've completely forgotten what I was going to say. Um, have you got a, a favourite game? Have you, have you got a game, or I'll, I'll just read it exactly, have you got a favourite game you worked on from the perspective of how happy you were regards the artwork you had put into it? What's your finest moment, in other words, would you say? Um, I don't know, because my job has changed so much now. It used to be about, like, putting pixels down, and now I'm, I'm building and texturing 3D models. So it's a bit different now. All right, to, 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 to kind of roll it back then, from the, the writing computer games on the Spectrum, was there any one particular game you said yeah, that was that was good? Are you, are you proud of them all? You don't no, want to pick your favourite? The most, the most happy with Chase HQ, I think. I, what the, yeah, sorry. No, you were going to say something there. What, no, what I was just going to say, so what, what I mean, you, you obviously did like, did you do loading screens and you also did in-game graphics. I did everything I mean, on that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I even got to design like the top part of the screen because obviously to to make the game run smoother, you only use like a little part of the screen, mm -hmm. and all of this doesn't get used. So um, we had a version of the game of the arcade machine in our arcade alley at the back. So I think I said to the coder, why won't we just copy what's on the arcade machine? They've got like 
the police lights at the side, instead of having the title across the top, we could put the score and all your heads up display and all stuff like that. And he was like, right, fine, do that. And then obviously when you catch up to the car, the lights flash. Yeah, great, fine. It's like you're playing the arcade. Um, also, the when we actually finished the game, there was quite a lot of RAM left over. So he was like, uh, the coder, John O'Brien, was like, well, we've got, got some memory left over. What do you want to do with it? Like, I don't know. <laughs> they won't come up with come up with an end sequence. I'm like, oh, okay then. So they came up with like five images that would like come up over the music. They would fade up and fade out, and then there was like hands that shook. They shook hands with like congratulations and all that sort of stuff. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, brilliant. We've still got a little bit of memory left. So anything else you want to do? Um. And I thought, well, right at the end, when you catch up to the guy, it went to a screen of them stood over with, like, guns pointing at the yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, we can't actually do that, but can we have, like, the door open and have them walk up and point the guns at the car? And it was like, yeah, yeah, go ahead and do that. So I did that. I put it in, and it was like, yeah, we ran out of memory now. So I had to take it back out again. So it would have been good to have that in. So, am I right in thinking the Chase HQ and the Spectrum was a multi load, isn't it? 148k, I think. Yeah, I think it all loads in on the 128. Aye, aye. I mean, it's it's mental for to hear you say that the guys like John's saying we've still got space left over. I mean, I know people talk about it all the time. Um, there's probably is it the Twitter logo probably has takes up more memory than the entire Chase HQ in the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's it's, it's mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing when you I think you come up with the example that um the the header of an email is more memory than elite on the spectrum, which had thousands of galaxies and planets in it. And you could travel <laughs> to each and every single one and buy and sell stuff. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's just absolutely insane. It just it really is. Did did you ever? Uh, you're talking about obviously you worked with different coders and that. I mean, what uh, is there any particular coder, graphic artist, Sid, uh, or sorry, musician, music musician at all that you that you regard highly? Or I regarded them all highly. I thought they were all better than me. <laughs> really, I, I I honestly did. So like we had. Uh, Steve Thompson, who was like a genius on the Commodore 64, the stuff he could do on, on like a, a screen with the different colours and stuff, he was just fucking amazing. What, what games did he work on? I'm not, not familiar with him. Um, the loading screen for Robocop, I think. The first one. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, it's a picture of him, his head from the side. Um, he did that one in particular. Um, all the code, everybody knew what they were doing. Yeah. Everybody was on the top of the game. They really were. Yeah. Did you ever? Did you ever meet Joffa Smith? No, no, I never did. But I, I know that when I was just before I applied for Ocean, he was the guy I always wanted to be. I wanted to be the guy that could code it and do the graphics and do the music just because right. like it's so big headed you think you can do it all yourself i thought yeah i could do that so like <laughs> so i'd like get like um game creators and stuff like that to to actually make little spectrum games it's it's fucking hard it is it is hard you, that's another level up being able to do all that yourself yeah, I mean, he was annoyingly, well, not so much me because I wasn't a coder or whatever, but he was able to pull it off. I mean, uh, every one of his games is just it's flawless. I mean, if you if you were to ask Spectrum owners to name a top 10 Spectrum games, I would guarantee there's going to be at least a couple of his games in there. He was, he was just, uh, I always loved the fact that he put his name backwards in games as well. Yeah, yeah, he used to do weird things on his game. I have, like, weird 
sort of in jokes and stuff in his uh, game. I remember getting a, a copy of Cobra and looking at the loading screen when it was loading, thinking this is going to be great. And then the game came on. I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> You're running about jumping on top of pipes, trying to escape some woman with a pram who's got a rocket launcher. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that can't be what the film's about, surely. But the more you play it, the, the more you get into it. You think, I, I, I don't care if the film's got nothing to do with this. This is actually this is actually quite playable. I'm enjoying it's, the film. It's, it's bloody good. It really is. I know, I know. Um, and obviously I, hypersports as well. I was, I really did like hypersports. That's great. Uh, Greenberry as well. I think Joffa did that. It's, yeah. The hy- I think Hypersports was the one that I liked the most because I just remember spending so much time on it. One of the games I actually bought with my own money. So, uh, <laughs> it was with a copy. So, yeah, I do remember playing it and thinking, this is great. I mean, it looks so much like the arcade. There's hardly any colour clash. Uh, it just looks uh, superb. And even, even he, seemed to, he seemed to have a knack of getting really cool little sounds out of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, I don't know what he did, but it was really, really, really smart. You could tell because a lot of the music and stuff that you would get in games would just be the beeper, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But he'd do all these like weird sort of instruments and proper synthesis and reverb and yeah, yeah. just absolutely phenomenal. So, what I mean, out of what's that? It wasn't just like a single tone, like uh, I. I was like, can you type you... it in and the beeper commands, like set it how, how like, wide you want it and how long. Yeah, it was like multi voice and that kind of stuff. Ah, just just incredible. So, did you Robocop was one of your uh, creations, wasn't it? Um, did you work on? Was it the loading screen you did in that one? That was the first thing that I did. The, the, no, not the first thing I did. It was the first thing that I had released was the loading screen for robocop so that was that was my first bit my first image that went out into the public oh i see right so that was an example that you had that you had done that you sent to no 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 i was like um i was already working on daily thompson mm-hmm. and gary came to me and said can you do a, ro- a loading screen for robocop because it's nearly finished i was like right okay um and they had the poster of the movie up and with a video camera and they took a picture of it and it was all like black and white and horrible and they sent it me and said there do that (laughs) (laughs) so i spent about a week um like cleaning it up and adding as much color as i could in with the time that i had didn't really have a lot of time yeah yeah Uh, and then handed it over they were like happy enough with it and it went out but that was that was the first bit of work that I, is actually out there in the public yeah i must have been pretty proud to actually see that getting getting loaded up on screens thinking that was me yeah but i didn't actually i didn't never saw it i never saw it because i never saw people loading the game up because i was already onto something else Aye. the only time i saw somebody loading my games up was when it again was chase hq because you'd go to WH Smiths and you'd see all the racks with all the game up and like the boxes and that would be like really exciting. And then you'd go to the the one time I went to the computer shop and somebody was actually loading Chase HQ on the Spectrum up on the machine. And there was like all these little boys hanging about looking over the counter <laughs> trying to trying to see it. And we were just stood at the back like <laughs> this, is, this is mental. <laughs> Did you not tell them though? Did you know you no, said that no, 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 no. I do remember one. I'll never forget this. One little boy looked over the counter and he said, "That is one righteous loading screen." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was in my dinner hour. So I was just like, "Come on, we need to go." <laughs> we need to get back to the office. So did you? Did you do all the graphics? Everything that you see in Chase HQ was that yourself, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean that you know Chase HQ is definitely regarded as. I mean, and I would be you know a sixty-four guy. I think it's generally regarded as one of the best, probably the best 
arcade port, certainly on the Spectrum, and it, it would be probably, you know, it's certainly the best, um, yeah, it's best uh, arcade port on the Spectrum, and it would have to be in the top 10 of arcade ports across all eight bits. I mean, it was a phenomenal game. The, obviously, the coding was as tight as anything, but the graphics looks fantastic. That must give you, that must give you a lot of, kind of, a lot of pride, thinking you were, you know, yeah, but what I didn't realise was they were actually having debates about which was the best between the Spectrum and the Amstrad. I never even gave it a second thought. But the people actually have like proper arguments about, oh, well, the, the Amstrad is more colourful. Yeah, but the Spectrum is faster. Oh, but, yeah, but that doesn't matter. Oh. Can grow up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be you'd be surprised at how uh, how uh, people can fall out over the slightest things. Quite, it's quite funny. Did you do the the graphics for the Amstrad one? Yeah, and you did. So you yeah, did. Like, so, the one. so it yeah. was like after after probably four or five months of doing the Spectrum that we then had four weeks to do the Amstrad version. So it was basically get it done and get it out as quickly as possible so don't think i was sat there like like every pixel was like oh my god should, should i use or yellow or orange on that one no it was just get it done and get it out <laughs> so what was see when you when you coded how did uh when you're working for ocean how did they uh, how did the actual who chose what games you had to work on and what uh what process did they follow as regards to graphics for like did you, I mean did you work on any non arcade games or was it all arcade conversions that you worked on? Uh Daily Thompson wasn't an arcade. Yeah. Uh, and then it was Dragon Ninja and shit game. Um Chase HQ, Batman on the ST and Amiga, Jurassic Park. On the ST and Amiga and the SNES, uh, Jurassic Park Two. So quite, mm -hmm. quite a few. Plus, uh, if ever, if ever Gary needed a loading screen for something, he would always come to me because he knew I could like knock knock him out really quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I remember getting they had a there was an arcade game called Typhoon that was coming out. Oh, I, yeah. And he said, well, we've, we've got this demo. It's coming out in New Sinclair. Uh, this was like just before dinner. Uh, can you get us a loading screen by the end of the day? <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> I had to. <laughs> and I only found it. I'd, I'd forgotten I'd done it. And then somebody on social media came up with it um, on, on their either Twitter, I think it was. And I'd not seen it. For like thirty oh. odd years when I last did it, really, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how, how long how long would it take you to kind of do a loading screen in on average? Well, again, it was it was time based. So if I had a week, it would take a week. I would spend yeah. more time on it. Um, Robocop was probably a week because it was already scanned in, so I just needed to like tidy up and color it in and stuff. Chase HQ was probably two weeks because we didn't have any, we didn't have any material for it at all. So we just basically made it up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it just depended on how much time I had and what, what they actually needed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what what percentage of your time was spent on loading screens and in-game graphics? And what did you prefer? Did you prefer doing in-game graphics or the loading screens or? Did you like both? Um, so you probably do three or four months of in-game in graphics and then like maybe two weeks on the loading screen. But the loading screen was always interesting because you'd get to see the cover of the game. So Bob Wakelin would have done some image mm -hmm. and you had to do a version of that. Ho hopefully, if it was <laughs> if it was done on time, you would get to you would get to do that. Um, sadly, I didn't get to copy any of his work because I don't think it was it was ready on time. So, I think I might have just 
he did chase HQ, didn't he? But I don't think I didn't yeah. have that much time to do it. I would have liked to have spent a proper length of time on it and actually do it some justice. <laughs> because obviously his stuff, the, the the covers that he did for the games were amazing. Oh, fantastic, I know. They really were. So what kind of did you did you with how much liaison did you have with the, the coder? Regards, would he tell you that right, you've got X amount of K or how how did it kind of work then? Um, well, you had well, it's based on it goes by the project. So if I use Chase HQ as an example, they'd probably say right, work for the cars scaling in and out, getting smaller and bigger. Um, they said right, do six levels of scale. For all right. the cars, um, and obviously you'd have a few different frames of animation for the car moving around and all that sort of thing. But even though I did six, I think they only used four, which I wasn't happy about because they just sort of boom oh, appear and then they're up the. Ah, yeah, yeah. I could tell that if they there was it was more smooth the transition of them getting closer, but. Mm -hmm. It's just down to the the machine and the the amount of memory you've got at the time. Yeah. So 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 going back again. So how how did when you finished a game, how did you know what game you're going to be working on? Would Gary come to you, or did you ever? Could you say to Gary or whoever, I'd like to work in this game? How did that? How did this sort of work allocation? Um, can it work? It's just based on who was available at the time. Um. I was fairly lucky that all of my stuff seemed to lead on to the next game. So, like uh, after after I think I think I did this that Dragon Ninja game, and then I worked with uh, Mike Lamb on Wet Le Mans, the racing game, and then went from that to Chase HQ. And then went from Chase HQ to mm -hmm. the 3D sections of Batman on the the ST and Amiga. So it was basically one. It was one flow of basically the same sort of thing. So sort of, yeah, engine kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I so Wake Le Mans was out before Chase HQ. Then you said yeah, yeah. Because I know this. I mean, the, the C64 version is push, but uh, the Spectrum version of Wake Le Mans is actually. It's got similar, it's got the hills and it's, you know, it, it does look, you can tell it's the, pun intended, the same similar engine that they used. Um, yeah, um, I don't know what, I know Mike Lamb did the engine for Sentient Software, I think, that brought the game out, but um, I don't know whether John O'Brien rewrote it or rewrote bits of it, but I think he may have used the Wet Le Mans engine as a basis and mm. just sort of polished it up and made it a bit more efficient. I, think, I can't remember if there's any hills in Wet Le Mans. Certainly isn't Chase HQ right enough. Oh, yeah, 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 there is, yeah. Because the hills it's right, right. off the ground. It's ah, right, right, right. right. Land again. Yeah. So what, what What did you, when, once, so once you'd finished the, doing the graphics, did you kind of pass it over and then that was, and you moved on to something else or were you, Involved in the project right up till release, sir. Uh, no, pretty much after after I had finished doing the graphics, it would probably just be another month before the game was actually ready to go out because obviously there was testing and yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of the time, I'd be sat around with nothing to do. So, like Gary would say, "Can you do a loading screen for this, or can you do something for that?" And I'm just trying to help her as much as I could. I've, so, I've done like little, little bits in various other games. I've, if somebody said, well, like, I need a sprite for this. So I did a sprite for some other game. I can't even remember what it was. But because you were free, you could just basically float around and do help out, but help out other people. Yeah. 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 So what, what was your, what was your impression when you first saw Chase HQ on the Spectrum, were you blown away like everybody else? On, on the Spectrum? Yeah. It, it's, it's quite an achievement. It was quite an achievement. I mean, 
I knew it was going to be massive because I remember playing the demo of um, Outrun on the Spectrum before I got the job at Ocean. And I was like, this is shit. This is nothing like the <laughs> what they had on the loading screens. You have the, screen, the pictures in the magazines. It didn't look anything like this. It's dead slow and the car was way too big and everything. You just couldn't play it. Yeah. So when I was told that I was going to be working on Chase HQ, I thought, well, this seems like a, a bit of a chance to sort of like show what I can do you know, have, have some input and like try and at least be better than this that had come out because I always saw the two games sort of as, as rivals. Yeah. So if you liked out, if you liked Outrun or you liked Chase HQ because like they, they were pretty much the same apart from you had to smash the car in. <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, it was quite an honour to get asked to do it. Especially with like the, how low regarded Ch uh, Outrun was at the time. Aye, I think I think most consumers, myself included, when uh, obviously were well, I, I was again I was on sixteen bit at the time, but yeah, Outrun was universally pushed. I think across all systems. Um, having said that, when I look at it's interesting when I when I think of some really crap games back in the day, when I look at them now. I think actually that's not as bad as I think it's actually all right. Um, I think with hindsight, we think, well, how the hell were they going to cram a, a Sega multi sprite bit of hardware into a Spectrum or a Commodore 64? Um, I think the big thing as well is when I load up a, a, a ROM on my Spectrum emulator, it's not costing me anything. Whereas if you are 16 years old and it's Christmas Day and you know you're, you've asked for Outrun and whatever it is, and you get it and you load it up and go, oh, this is terrible. So I suppose there's a bit, a bit you different there. Play it and get your money's worth out of it. Aye, aye. <laughs> always, always think it's quite interesting. If you bought a, a TV and the picture quality was diabolical, you would take it back. If you got a pair of shoes that didn't really fit properly, you'd take them back. I never, ever once took back a computer game. I, I bought plenty of shit games, including Cobra for the C64, which is a diabolical game, and I never, I never once took it back. Whereas, in hindsight, forty years later, you think, well, wait a minute, I would be entitled to take it back. I think there was probably no returns on shop shop windows, but probably you would be entitled to get your money back. <laughs> yeah, I think the only time I had had a similar experience was there was um, there was a video reno shop that was about three miles in, in the next village. It sounds like ancient, didn't it? Medieval. In the next village, <laughs> there was a video shop that sold games. So me and my mate got some money together and we walked to the next village and we had a look, in, had a look at the games that were out and there was this game called Bugaboo the Flea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they didn't really have much else. So I thought, oh, buy that it might be all right then walked all the way home loaded it up they're like fucking hell <laughs> what, a, what a waste of time and money i was knackered as well because it was like, <laughs> it was like like it, what it is now it was dead sunny so we were like knackered just wanting to get this game on and play it see what it was like <laughs> i think i played it for about five minutes and then thought no i'm not going to play it again i didn't think i'd well, take it back yeah. to the show it was just like, no, I don't, I'm not interested. Aye, and you put it down to experience. The funny thing is, that was one of the games that was always on in John Menzies. They always had it because it was one of the few games, it was one of the first games that kind of had an intro. It had the intro where it jumping along and then it, it would fall down and it, the screen would go like that and then it would fall down and go, uh, and you'd have to kind of catch oh, yeah. up. But it was always on. I don't I don't remember it doing that. <laughs> maybe maybe you got a, a dark version. I think I think I've wiped it from my memory. PTSD <laughs> or something. What what used to happen if you bought a shit game, you would just record something else over it. That was what you did. Oh yeah, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, yeah. that's why I've saved all my uh, cover tapes. 
cup it get somebody's brought Ghostbusters over right I'll save it over this Yost and clear tape <laughs> So did, did you mention there, Bill, that so you, did you do any coding on the C6, uh, C64 on the 16 bit? Did you mention you'd done Batman, the movie Batman on the yeah. Amiga? Yeah. The, so did the, you, the, the 3D section. With the, the driving? Yeah. That's annoyingly, I, I mean, that is, I wasn't, I'll be perfectly blunt with you, I wasn't a big fan of movie type games because I'm not, I'm not really into movies but that was one game that I, I remember playing it and I was my jaw hit the floor when I saw that driving section and to this day I've never been able to find a copy of that game that that section works I don't know why but that was mind blowing I, 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 on the actual hardware aye aye no 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 on, just on emulation oh on an emulator I've yeah. never, I've never really tried a, an Amiga emulator. I don't know why. why. But I mean that that section alone was bloody impressive. Um the the Chase H, I Chase HQ did come out for the, the Amiga, I think, but that 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 engine that they used, I mean the graphics as well for that particular section were just it was it was really impressive. That was Same really impressive. Yeah. Same so did you what's that? It was the same guy, same guy coded it. Oh, was it really? Yeah. Yeah. So did you do any like in-game graphics for uh, apart from that game on any other 16-bit machines? Uh Jurassic Park. Um what did I do? I, I did the um the sprites for Jurassic Park. You know the little characters running about all the different mm -hmm. kinds of, and the dinosaurs and stuff. I think I did all the dinosaurs apart from the T-Rex. Um, and I did the raptors in the SNES version as well. Well, so you worked in that as well then, yeah, yeah. Uh, only because Gary didn't like the original raptors that they had in the SNES version. He thought they should look better. And because I'd already done them, he wanted me to do uh, slightly less good versions on the SNES because you had less colours. <laughs> what, less colours than the, than like the Amiga, was it? Yeah, I think they probably had like 16 colours per spray and probably 8 on the SNES. Oh, I that wrong. Yeah. I don't know. It was a long, yeah. a long time ago. <laughs> so what was, what was the very last uh, Ocean game you worked on then? Jurassic Park 2. Which the, would be the main, the main character was running about with a gun and he could like do like hand over hand over like uh cables and various things right. like that and i i left in the early stages of that game mm -hmm. so you said left did you did you choose to leave ocean at that point yeah um Steve Wahid had left before me and he'd gone and started up this company called Malibu Interactive or he'd opened up a studio that was owned by Malibu Interactive uh, and he was looking for people so he had a couple of people from Ocean were there um, and he asked me to go along with him so i basically because ocean was really going down the toilet at that point gary had gone it was getting bought out by infograms the management yeah. was just awful um so i decided it was time to leave so i went to to work for him and unfortunately uh none of the games that i worked on actually came out because they, yeah. they, get, they got bought out by Marvel Comics, some little comic company you might have heard of. And uh, no, they, like they, they, like EA, they came in nothing, obviously. Yeah, uh, well, they had um, Malibu Comics had uh, a load of superheroes because Marvel Comics was tanking at this point, nobody was buying them because the characters were like dead boring and all the rest of it. But Malibu had these, they had their version of characters, of the, the Marvel characters, but they were slightly different. Like you'd have, oh God, let me think. There was a 
character who was a guy, but when he changed into his superhero other half, it was a woman called Mantra. <laughs> so that was like, whoa, what's going on there? This is like more interesting than what they're doing. And they had their own version of like Iron Man called Prototype. There was a guy who was called Firearm, which was basically their version of the Punisher. But they had different twists on the characters to make them more interesting. So everybody was buying these Malibu comics. Um, but I think the main thing that I've read this online, I don't know how true it is, but they had this sophisticated coloring technique that they had in all their comics. So all the comics looked like really glossy. The coloring was amazing. It was all done on computer, never been done before. Um, so it's like, you know, like on Photoshop, if you draw a line there and then draw a line there and say, right, I want it to go from white to black. It just went, boom, just did it. You didn't mm. have somebody paint it. So mm. it, it looked all really clean. But then Marvel decided we want that. So we're going to buy the company and we're going to just put all the characters. They're all retired. There's no more comics and we're just going to use the technology that they've got to then bring out their new comics with this, this new colored feature. So we were out of a job. <laughs> we didn't have anything to do. But that was, it was weird because that was the day that I was made redundant and then had a new job in the space of an hour. <laughs> it was basically Steve were hit again. He, we were in the office and he said, uh, Right, I'm sorry to tell you all, but we've been bought out by uh, Marvel Comics and you're all been made redundant. And we were like, oh, fucking hell. Thinking I've just left Ocean to come here and then in a year I've been made redundant. And then he went, you're now going to be taken on, you're going to be part of Time Warner Interactive. Because he'd already done a deal with Time Warner who wanted a games um, Mm -hmm. so we went from one job to another in like space of an hour so we, <laughs> we went right okay so we went home and then we came back in the following monday um, <laughs> and job. We, we were working on something else <laughs> <laughs> you didn't i think you didn't get any redundancy pay i know for a year i wouldn't have think it Probably no not, no, no. no. <laughs> so did you, obviously, magazines, I mean, we're talking pre-internet, magazines were the only, apart from either looking at it in a shop or trying your pal's game, magazines were the internet of the day, you know, I mean, when when Zap 64 came along, that was my Bible, you'd buy it every month and you would look down at it and go, that game's shit, blah, 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 whatever, and that was what it was. Did you, did you kind of have a relationship with the, uh, with the, the magazines and did you go to any of the kind of trade shows and that kind of stuff? No, not really. Um, before I sort of got in the industry, I knew I wanted to do something sort of artistic. So I remember sending a few cartoons into your Sinclair that got printed in the magazine. So I was like, oh, wow. So maybe I can be a cartoonist. <laughs> this, is, this is before I decided that I was going to be doing like, uh, computer graphics. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I just knew that I wanted to do something artistic and I liked, I was interested in media, so magazines I was interested in. But then you had magazines on tape as well. So that was interesting. Um, so yeah, it, it was basically, I was buying stuff like um, computer and video games and Yul Sinclair. To, to see what was coming out in the arcades and what was coming out on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and that was basically what, what I was like in contact with. So when I, if I got a new magazine, I bought your Sinclair, I had a mate up the road who bought Crash and then we'd swap. Um, so that's, that's how we did it. That's... Yeah. So after uh, so that that new gig with Time Warner, how did that go then? How long were you working there for? And what what games were you working on? 
Um, I'm trying. What was the um? What so timeline wise, Bill? What we're we talking about? What year are we talking about? Uh, Late ninety. 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 Five or six would have been Time Warner Interactive. So we're talking, we're talking play, PlayStation. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Did one, you yeah. work in any of these systems? Uh, yeah, but the first, the first game that we did was on the PlayStation. So they basically said, right, we want a game on the PlayStation. Off you go then. So I was like, oh god, what are we gonna do? We did had no idea what we were gonna do, and. I had come out with um, I'm trying to think what the what the sport was. There used to be a like on the opening credits of um, Miami Vice. There was this guy playing a sport where the guy had was wearing a big massive sort of shell on his hand, <laughs> and you picked up a ball and you like flung it. I didn't know because you only saw the guy do that with the ball. Baseball. Because no, he had a big massive thing attached to his arm, oh. so he would scoop the ball up and like fling oh, it. I have kind of, it's like it's like a bit like these things you get for your dog, you put the ball in, you go like that. Yeah, like, yeah, like lacrosse, that. I think they call it I some yeah, yeah. So I saw this and thought I could do a game out of this. So I sort of typed up a design of it was a sports game. It was like two players against two players, so you could have four players playing it at once. Yeah, we'll make it futuristic. Yeah, we'll put aliens in it, um, <laughs> and that they were quite happy to do that. So that became uh, Pitbull on the PlayStation One, a game that wasn't really that big, but the people that bought it really liked it. Because obviously you could have like four people playing on the one PlayStation in the room at once. And there was also a management section where you could manage the team and like go through different stages. It was kind of like, I don't know if FIFA even did that back then. But it was just something that was tacked on it. So there was plenty of gameplay involved. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first thing that we did on the um on the playstation and then i think they wanted us to do we got an arcade version we got an arcade machine of primal rage remember that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh i think they wanted us to do a pc version of it so there wasn't really much art wise to do because we just took the graphics out of the machine i think Ah, you could virtually replicate them. Yeah, yeah. Do whatever you wanted. So, a lot of the time, most of what we did was play Quake on the network. <laughs> As you do, I. Yeah, that that was pretty much what we did most of the time. Either that, or we we start drawing our own skins on the characters. <laughs> like somebody done Spider Man, and somebody done Doctor Who, and somebody done Captain America, and you know, someone like running about. <laughs> <laughs> so how i mean obviously i can imagine the technology that you were using to write a, a loading a graphic on the spectrum to then go into the playstation must have been completely different be like two polar opposites how did you find the change and what what technology did you prefer working on on the playstation uh i didn't actually do any of the in-game graphics um i then was moved on to doing the fmb because i just started getting into well i think i'd been using like a dos version of 3d studio back in about 92 or something when i was still at ocean so in 96 every game had to have fmv in it they all had to have them in so i was making um little movies to introduce the characters and stuff like that i did the intro movie for it as well i just recently set up a, a playstation uh, emulator and managed to record all of my uh, fmvs <laughs> and put them on youtube 
So it was a bit weird seeing them again because most of them are like really shit. But at the time, it was like, whoa, this is amazing. <laughs> I mean, do you have any fondness for these, like the PlayStation days, or is it, is it more the, the original, the, the early days of the Spectrum and Eight Bit? PlayStation was quite an exciting time because um, I think the whole, the whole, like it was. I think Labour had just got in and things were starting to change and like there was the football and the Euros in 96 and the PlayStation came out and everything was like, there was loads of energy. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, I, I remember like um, white, getting Wipeout on the PlayStation, just thinking it was amazing. It had this like space age music, which sounds really dated now, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. So it, it it was it was exciting all around when it came out because it came out I think at just the right time. Mm-hmm. And at the end, obviously, the N sixty four came out at that time as well. So I had to buy both, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> because I I bought it and you got um, Golden Eye with it free. And oh, I'd never yeah. played the Golden Eye. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't really have much coverage in the in the the games media either. It was just like buy an N sixty four, you get this Golden Eye with it, mm-hmm. and it was just like amazing. It was like one of the best three D shooters ever. Yeah, I always think that the, the N sixty four hasn't. It's not. I, in fact, I don't think. The, I don't think the N sixty four's aged well. I don't think that the PlayStation is aged well because that was the the first sort of like uh, 3D type machines. I mean, you look at like GoldenEye now, you know that oh, yeah. <laughs> it's got like the guy's face stretched across like any like diamond. It looks it just looks hideous. But <laughs> yeah, but I did buy um, when the 3DS 3DS came out. I did buy Ocarina of Time again. When they remastered it and redid all the graphics, yeah, yeah, and that was that was just brilliant. Really enjoyed that <laughs> because obviously it was fine playing it on the telly and everything was a bit blocky. Yeah, but it just it was just like that extra bit of space having like the, the nicer looking graphics and animation in it. I think to be fair to like you know like the, the N sixty four, even probably back in ninety six, I was probably playing it on a. I don't know. But you're, yeah, you could plug it into your TV, which was maybe a, a luxury TV in 96 with your 32 inch. Now you've got a, I've got a 55 inch TV downstairs, and you know, these games look hideous, but they're never designed to be on big screens like that. And obviously, they're super sharp, and so you don't have the blurriness as well. I bought a massive TV off Steve Wahid, actually. He was getting a new TV, and he sold me his old one. It was one of them, it was probably about 40 something inch screen but obviously it took both of us to carry it up the stairs <laughs> in my flat it was huge i had that telly for years <laughs> so you don't got any more there no is it going no it's away <laughs> <laughs> so was was there any any game that did see when a game came out did you always kind of have a quick look at the the reviews to see what they were saying for graphics or be not really bothered or... yeah it was, it was like a it was like a bear pit because everybody was like oh what did you get for graphics seven i got eight on my last game <laughs> so it was like it was like a real competition so, so was there any game that you got shit reviews for graphics <laughs> got shit reviews for the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> um yeah robocop 3 on the snes Really, I yeah. Game, just not, I was not interested in doing it at the time. Aye. I spent low amount of energy doing it, and when it came out, it was crap anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that a three D type game? I'm not. I mean, I'm not even no, familiar with that game. Aye, aye, aye. I suppose, like anything, if you go in half assed you know it's not going to be good. If you're not interested, you're not going to put your best, the best side into the game. I had just come off doing Batman the movie with all the 3D, like the, the uh, truck and all the rest of it. And then he said, right, you're going to be doing Robocop 3. I'm like, really? The game, the, the film's not even out. It's delayed. And it's supposed to be shit anyway because the second one wasn't that great. 
So we didn't really have much to go on. So I was like, not interested. I'll just do the bare minimum. Aye, aye. Pretty awful to think that it's not very professional, but you know, <laughs> if, you, if you're not into it, you're not into it, are you? <laughs> one of the one of the things uh, I'm I'm a, obviously being a C64 guy, I still love all my sad music. Some of the stuff they put out now is amazing. And one of the things that's uh, it's quite is is out there is there's some amazing like sad tunes, but the games are absolutely pish. I mean, things like uh, Miami Vice. Um, I would say Rambo on the, the C64. Was there any game that you put your heart and soul into the graphics and you think, I've absolutely knocked it out of the park, and then you saw the game and you went, Jesus, the game is shit, and you were a bit disappointed that your graphics ended up in a shit game? <laughs> I've been quite lucky, actually. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, no... Just try to think. I was going to say something that's just gone out of my head based on that. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. Apart, obviously, Robocop was just yeah. Uh, Robocop three was just terrible. I, I didn't even. But then you, interested in doing that. You weren't really fussed about that because you yourself knew that you hadn't really given your all for it, so you weren't really that bothered yeah. when it came out of. I did um I did some graphics for a, a game um a PC game called Flesh Feast. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go with that one, Flesh Feast. Hi, it's not what you think. It's the horror game. <laughs> and um again I was doing FMV. So I was doing like zombies getting their heads smashed in with that. And thinking, oh yeah, this is great. I love doing this. And then once I'd done that, they said, right, well, we need you to do some skins for the characters that were similar to like Quake. I was like, all right, I've done that before. That's not a problem. So I started doing them. And then when I actually saw the game, I was like, Jesus Christ, is this it? They've been working on this for ages. It's absolutely awful. If you get a chance, look it up. Flesh Feast on the PC. Oh, well. <laughs> it's like it's like top down, uh, and you run around in 3D, but then the whole thing rotates as well, and you've got zombies chasing you and trying to attack you at the same time. Oh God, it's so bad. <laughs> but you are you quite were you quite happy with the graphics that you've done for it then? Um, yeah, I suppose I was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was FMV and then it was some like quick pixel art, but they were always saying how great how well it was it was going and how great the game was, but then I didn't actually see it until after it was completed. Ah, it was out there. Yeah, and yeah. Then it was like, what the hell is this? So that's that's probably the one. Not unless I can, I can't think of anything else. It's probably that yeah. one. Yeah. So how long did you how long did you spend at Time Warner then, and what where did you go from there? Uh, Time Warner was another one that lasted between a year and eighteen months, and then they got bought out by somebody else, and we were maybe done it again. Uh, then I went to the company that did Flesh Beast, and then they went under, and then I was at work again. And then I was not in the industry for quite a few years after that. All right. right. Um, I didn't get back into it until um, around 2002, where uh, Simon Butler you used to work at Ocean, he was mm -hmm. doing like, um, he was doing pixel graphics for mobile phone games. Um, and I was in contact with him and he, he would sometimes send, like say, do you want some work here? Do this, I'll give you 50 quid cash. <laughs> so I was like, right, okay, I'll do that. And then he said, oh, I've got this interview in Manchester, but I don't want to go. So do, do you want me to what do you want me to recommend you to go so i was like yeah okay then so i went for that interview and got the job so that was at rockpool games 
and that was all uh, mobile phone games before the iPhone came out. So it was all the Nokia's, the smartphones, and all of the other. Um, the Engage. Did you work in the Engage at all? Probably. The probably a version that worked in the Engage. Yeah. Um. Which was fine. I mean, we worked on a few titles, but then I also got to work on um, Sonic the Hedgehog. I got to work on two or three Sonic the Hedgehog games and a few. Uh, remember Worms? Mm hmm. Did uh, a couple of a couple of those. Was that for the mobile? For like mobile phones? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Right, right, right. yeah. Uh, I think I helped out on a a mobile phone version of like Moto GP, which was like a 3D motorbike racing game, which was probably less less power than a PS1. So the, the background was like right in front of you, and stuff would just like come towards <laughs> you. Um, but then I sort of moved up and moved up, started doing little bits of 3D, and then the company was like, right, well, we're going to start doing console games now. We're going to start doing stuff on the DS. So they knew somebody who had the license to top trumps. So they wanted somebody to do a version of that on the DS. <laughs> so I got to do a Doctor Who top trumps game on the DS. <laughs> so did that and then they shut the company down um they got bought out by idos um and then they decided to shut the company down and then after that i didn't really have a lot to do because finding jobs were pretty hard then um if you weren't already established in a company it was pretty difficult to get in yeah, yeah. um so I actually jumped in and decided to just be a contractor. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, a, a couple of people helped me and said, talk to this person. They'll be able to help you get some work. This person will explain to you how you do your taxes and how you do all that. And so that was it. From then on, I was a contractor. So I was then working at um, Sumo Digital. Mm -hmm. and few other places in in um in sheffield and i'm still contracting now and you're still involved in making games yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's funny how when I, I talk to various programmers like i was mentioning sean southern and other guys like that my heart always sinks when they talk when they say they're working on mobile phone games because i'm old school that's a phones for phone, and I, I just kind of I can't even bother with mobile phone games. But at the end of the day, you guys have got to still earn a crust, and there's not really. Whilst there is, there is a certain demand for coders for like you know they're still making games for the C sixty four and all that. You've got to earn a living, and so you've got to go where the where the wages are. Eh? The iPhone was probably the worst thing to happen to computer games ever, <laughs> because. People wanted everything for free. Yeah, totally agree with you. Totally so agree with you. If you were like, right, well, we want to do this. Like, I worked on an MMA game for the iPhone and for Android. So obviously, they went and they got some funding and they got a lot of coders and artists in. And then it was like, nobody was going to buy it. So you have to throw loads of adverts in. So People don't like adverts, so they wouldn't download the game. So it was just like you're instantly you're just losing money straight away because mm -hmm. you wanted to make this game that you want to make on a phone, which you thought, well, it's fucking iPhones everywhere. You think you'd make some money out of it? Yeah, not really. I know. Uh, I know. Jeff Minter said. I mean, Jeff brought out about. I don't know. He brought out maybe about a half a dozen games on iOS, and after a couple of years, he just people were complaining. So you know, I I I bought Red Runner, whatever it is, two thousand, and I can't find it on the shop. And what Jeff said was, 
it costs me money. It costs me two hundred pounds to keep these games on iOS. I'm not making any money from him. He, he he's, he's publicly publicly said that he made no money at all yeah. on these games. Didn't he make a penny? It's, it's it's quite it's sad when you hear about that. And that that always really gets to my tits, if you excuse the the pun or the the phrase. People people expect games for free now. You if you recommend. You recommend a good game um, on your YouTube channel. Say this game is brilliant, best shoot 'em up ever. It's nine ninety nine. People are like, "What nine ninety nine? I'm not paying nine ninety nine for that." They want it for a pound, whatever. I mean, there was a game that uh, one of my mates did a review of. I can't remember what it was, and uh, he got it for a pound on Steam. And I went in, I had a look, and it was like, "He's a lying bastard." It's up to three pounds, and I thought, <laughs> well, man, "Look at this game, three pounds." You know, there's there's a game there, Drop Zone. Archer McLean programmed that back in oh, 1985. Yeah. That was probably 9.99 in 1985, which is probably the equivalent of about 30 quid. Now people complain if you say, "Oh, it's 4.99." Oh, I'm not paying that. It's, it's shite. It, it's not so bad on console on Steam and stuff like yeah. that, but on a phone, the, the people they, they want it for free. But and yeah. then because they want it for free, you have to find like imaginative ways to get money out of them like with microtransactions or yeah spend Bollocks. three pound on coins that you can spend on this and they're like no yeah yeah <laughs> they would rather grind and grind and grind and grind for hours Aye. than spend three quid on 10 coins yeah whereas i would i would rather pay four pound 99 on an android game and it's just there, you know what I mean? <laughs> but then again, on the other hand, there is the people on the other side that will spend like 50 quid for like uh, accessories for a free game. So yeah. obviously it, the, the ones that don't want to spend any money really outweigh the ones that do want to spend it. Aye. Well, you, you look at, I mean... You can buy this, this little loan company, EA, can't remember who they were. They make a game called oh, FIFA. Uh, I can't remember. E -E 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 something or another, can't remember. Never came to anything. But they, they've got this game called FIFA. And it's like, you can if you go into uh, the game game shop, or whatever it's called, like game, and it'll be like FIFA 2022, 79.99, or you can get 99.99. You're like, What? But then I suppose if you think back again, you paid 40 quid for a SNES game. But it's, as you say, you've got the polar opposites who will pay 70, 80 quid and they'll, they'll, uh, their, their kid will get £30 worth of upgrades for their birthday so they can get a Lionel Macy top or whatever. It's all that bullshit. Yeah. Then you've got people who complain about paying £1.99 for a mobile game. That used to really piss me off because my girlfriend's son was really into FIFA at that time. Uh, and he would be like, "Can I have a, can I have a tenner to spend on FIFA?" Like, what for? I want to buy this player pack. It was like a fucking pack of like trading cards that you would have got back in the day, where you'd get like five players, and one would be like medium, and the rest would be shit. <laughs> so we just wasted ten quid. Don't, yeah, don't get me started on loot box and all that kind of stuff. I've had multiple arguments with uh, a certain individual through that wall um, mm -hmm. about spending 20 quid on shit. Yeah. It's just digital. But I suppose that's yeah, that, that's maybe down to old age, Well, I, I think you and I are old school. You wanted to go into John Menzies. You wanted to pick up the tape and go, oh, that looks good. I think I'll buy that. You hand over your 9 99 and you load it and that's it. Whereas nowadays you buy, I mean, there's even... That's yeah, even you don't get half a game and then download the other half right. like in three months. Apparently, apparently, uh, there's 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 been games that have come out for modern consoles, and quite literally, all you've got in it is the thing that will download the game. There's really no code on the disc. You put it in, and then it'll be like a sixty-five gig download. Yeah, <laughs> it's downloading the game, so you're actually not. It's, and then, of course. On the flip side of that, you get there's been games that come out on a CD or a, a DVD or a Blu-ray probably, and it's got the game, and then it's also got these additional levels, 
but you've got to buy these additional levels. And some people are saying, well, wait a minute, I've bought the disc. I own the disc. Why am I having to pay? But mm. the argument is, well, that's just the way we store them. And my 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 old brain can't fathom that. And I think, no, nah, fuck that. I want, if I pay for a game, I want everything there. You know, it was like that thing. music game, wasn't it? Where you had the, the guitar and the drums and everything. You only oh, had a certain amount mind. of songs. Yeah, and then you had yeah. Grained and grained and grained to get the other songs that were like loads better than the ones you had to play through. <laughs> so, well, I've got all the songs. Why can I not just play them? Yeah. You need to unlock them. So, obviously, yeah, the fact that you're on this channel, Bill, and I've seen you watching a few of my videos, you obviously still enjoy the scene. Um, are you surprised at how much love there is for stuff that that you and guys like yourself did, like, the best part of 40 years ago? Do you, do you enjoy the whole reminiscing and people talking about the games from back in the day? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always been surprising. I mean... It, it still makes you feel the same as when you went into WH Smith that first time and saw like your game box on the shelf. But then we had already moved on to the next game, so we never really gave it a second thought after that. Mm. But then you forget, you don't realise that there's like thousands of kids playing playing the game and playing it for hours. So I mean I've had the example of when I went to work for a company um, and there was this guy who was one of the new coders there. Um, and uh, we sort of like, it was my first day, I think, and we were sort of introducing ourselves. And I like said my name and he said, oh, where did you used to work? And I said, oh, I used to work at Ocean. Did you? What, what did you work on? Uh, what's on like, Batman and Jurassic Batman, yeah. Me and my little brother used to play that when we were five. <laughs> so I get a lot of that. <laughs> I worked with a guy in my the job that I'm in. Um, there was a guy that was working with me. He was uh, he was when was he born? He was born after I think he was born after the PlayStation Two came out. That just blows my tiny mind. That's ridiculous. <laughs> And lastly, Bill, finally, or so, sorry, the, the, the second last question. Um, do you play many games these days, or is your time spent watching cantankerous old Scottish guys playing games poorly on YouTube? Well, I've got a mirror so I can see another cantankerous old Scottish <laughs> Um No, I still play games. Yes, please. Still play games. Oh, you're, um, you're talking about the Switch, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but at the moment, um, because of the Steam sale, I've bought um, Subnautica. Uh, I, I've heard of that. Remind me, what's that about again? I have heard of it. I can't think what it is. Uh, oh, God. You're sort of like uh, you've crashed on this planet in the water and you've got like uh, a scuba suit and you basically go around and scavenge for stuff and... Uh, you have to craft things and build things and go to places and you have to get food or you'll die. It's like a survival game. But um, because I'm working in VR now... I'm just um, going to ask you that. Yeah, yeah, VR. So you're working in that. Mm -hmm. It's like the ideal game for like the VR headset because your view is like through a mask, like an air mask. Mm -hmm. So you get this extra bit of like it's an extra bit of sort of reality because you can actually feel the mask on your face. You <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, oh my God, it doesn't have to make you feel sick. <laughs> uh, they, haven't, they haven't got the controls completely right. So when you move your head up, it pans up. And when you move forward, you go in the direction that you're looking. <laughs> you go up the VI. <laughs> yeah, so it's not as if you can move around and sort of look around at the same time. You basically walk. Yeah. So I'm like, going over here and going up like going down and going up oh yeah and it, it does you do get a bit of motion sickness in it but yeah so, I, I mean, yep. i'll play stuff i've still play stuff on my switch i mean i've got a um i've got one of those uh chinese uh retro consoles um like an Ambernick 
something. Oh, I, yeah. I've got a few I've got one of here, which is like full of ROMs and stuff. And sometimes I'll go in and I don't play old games like, oh, my favorite old game. I play stuff that I've not played before. <laughs> so a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that I've missed out on that was really good. Um, so I play stuff like that. And I've got a PS4, but I don't really spend that much time on it. But I think it's more to do with the, like it being portable, the Switch. I can actually play that. Do you actually I... play it handheld, or is it usually on the TV? Not all the time, because I like being sat in front of the telly. Aye, aye. I find as my eyes are getting worse. Um, I, just, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, probably 40 years ago, if somebody told me that I would own a small device... Uh, the size of a calculator, and I would have every single game ever released on it. That would have bl- that would have just like blown my mind. And now that I've got, I've got multiple ones. Back there, you can probably see. Um, I never actually really use them. I mean, if I'm going on holiday or maybe on a, a train or whatever, I'll maybe take down something and play it. But I just find the, the, the screen a bit too small. But again, that's probably just a that's yeah. probably an age thing. I think. It's the same with me. I mean, I, I have to double up sometimes. I've got two pairs of glasses <laughs> that to see, like a, a screen up here. I've got my normal glasses, and then I've got some readers that I put on over the top. <laughs> I actually got. Um, I was. I, I've been wearing contact lenses for years, and the last time I got my my uh, my eyes checked, I said to the guy, "I says, I don't suppose you can." I says, "The great thing," I says. I've got great eyesight without lens. I've got great. I can read tiny writing when I don't have my lenses in. But my, my distance is shit. I says so now that I wear contact lenses, my distance is fantastic. But I can't see how long to put my fish fingers in the oven for. My arms aren't long enough. <laughs> I says I don't suppose you can get something like uh, whatever it's called. What's the dual vision? Whatever it is. Uh, well, bi- <laughs> bifocals. I don't suppose you can get bifocal contact lenses. They went, you can. But what? Really? I says, why, did, why did nobody tell me? So I've been wearing these bifocal lenses and it's literally one is geared for distance, one is not quite as strong, so I can see, great, I can now read. I don't have to help bother with my £1.99 reading glasses. I can <laughs> read small and distance. I'll, so uh, I'll stick with these. <laughs> shoot <me in. laughs> Listen, Bill, last, last question. And I think I know the answer. Spectrum or no. Commodore 64? Spectrum or Commodore 64? Oh, God, not this again. <laughs> um, Spectrum because that's the one I know the most. Yeah, I thought as much. Not for any other reason. <laughs> Commodore 64 was great because you got fantastic music on it. But you know, personally, just I do Spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll let you, I'll let you off for that. Anyway, listen, Bill, it's been an absolute bloody pleasure. Um, I'm going to wind it up. Now, because I like to annoy all those with OCD, and this is going to probably come in at about one hour and 56 minutes. Wow. So that's just anno- that's to annoy all these people. So listen, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Bill. Um, thank you very much. Please continue to watch my live streams. It's always great having guys like yourself. Oh, yeah. that. Are you planning, do you go to many of the, like the retro events at all? I've not been for a couple of years, but I'm planning to go to the Blackpool one this year. Yeah. Is it got a, is there a date? Is a date being announced for it? November, I think. Oh, is it? Ah, I'll need to try and get down there. I'm it's planning the to Nord organise. Rec. What's that? Down at the Nordbreck. Aye, Nordbreck Hotel. Yeah, I'm planning. I'm hopefully going to arrange a a, a visit to Arcade Club, probably the Blackpool one. I reckon probably October time. So I'll give you a shout. It'd be great to get you along. It's always good fun if you've never been to the Arcade Club. Then prepare it. That will make up for all these years where we, you and I, couldn't get to arcades. Aye, so listen, yeah. Bill. Yeah, just once again, mate. Thanks for taking time out of your night to talk no fish with me. It's always no an problem. absolute Good. pleasure. Okay, then, Bill. Thanks very much, buddy. See ya. Take care, man. See ya.